Today we're talking about the six secrets of highly performing PhD students. Most people think a PhD and success means more stress, more work, and just hating the process. But let me tell you this, that is not the case. There's actually a number of very simple rules that allow you to actually succeed in a PhD while enjoying the process and becoming a top PhD student. And today we're going to be talking about them. So here you can see I've got the six ways of becoming a high performing PhD student. And the first one I want you to know is ruthless prioritization. What I want you to be able to do is say yes to some things and no to other things. And arguably you say no to most things. Now here's the thing. The ruthless prioritization means that you have to stop being a yes person. When you're a PhD student, especially early on, you feel like like you need to do what your supervisor says or what the university is always putting on you, but you have to ruthlessly prioritize to make sure that you are doing the activities that only get you closer to the end goal of finishing your PhD. And so I was reading this sort of like self-help book when I was in my self-help journey a few years back. And there was one thing that kind of really stuck with me that I want to share with you, and that is the best weightlifters in the Olympics are not good at doing a load of different tasks. They are good at staying focused and doing the same lift a thousand plus times to perfect that. And that's how you need to think about your PhD. Think about the tasks, reduce it to the essential tasks and get good at doing those. The problem is our brains want a little bit of distraction as well, where all of a sudden we're like, oh, this is a little bit shiny, I'll do that. Oh, this is a little bit shiny, I'll do that. A new and interesting, mm, I like that. But here's the thing is that it's only a distraction. Get used to just focusing on the tasks that actually get you towards your PhD, which is coming up with experiments, doing experiments, and analyzing the data, understanding it and communicating it and doing that over and over again until you get enough data to fill up a thesis, which makes someone go, oh yeah, this is enough work, isn't it? Number one, prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. So the second thing you need to know about is consistent habits. Now, I can pretty much tell you whether or not a PhD student is going to be successful or not, depending on what their day and week looks like. There are some tasks you need to do every day and you need to prioritize, linking it back to the first one. See what I did there? Now, here's the thing. Your daily tasks should get you closer to your PhD, but we're not talking about massive tasks here. We're just sort of saying daily habits could be like every day I'm going to do something towards producing a figure for my thesis or to communicate to my supervisor. Every day I'm going to sit down for half an hour, I'm going to write a little bit about my work um, to communicate it to someone. All of these little daily tasks just mean that you'll be slowly adding to the success which will be your PhD. Now, these daily tasks and the weekly tasks will change depending on what stage of your PhD you're in. Early on, you're going to be doing more reading. You're going to be doing more exploratory stuff. You're going to be coming up with ideas. Then in the middle bit, it's the grunt work. You're going to be there doing stuff. So daily doing is what you should be thinking. Every day, go to the lab and do something. And then at the end, it should be writing. Every day, you're going to write a little bit, produce a figure, talk about that figure. So those three sort of sections of your PhD uh, journey will dictate your daily and weekly habits, but a PhD student who is successful will always, always have habits that they follow. They'll be like, oh, it's a Monday, I do this, or, oh, it's the end of the week, I do this. All of the simple things you can do really help build up the momentum and allow you to finish your PhD strong. Now, that's what you've got to be doing. Think about your daily habits and have a little bit of discipline with yourself and say, you know what, I'm going to do this habit every single day because that's the important stuff. Remember to stay around to the end of this video because the most important things I've saved till last. The third thing is related to your mental health. We don't like to talk about it very often. It seems like it's a little bit too uh, abstract that doesn't fit into our rigorous research approach. But here's the thing, you are your research. Your research can only function as well as you can. So all of the really successful PhD students that I've seen in the past and work with today are always, always focused on 
what they do to enjoy themselves, and I love it. The most happy and successful PhD students still have hobbies outside of academia. They still do what they liked before. A lot of the times we feel like this PhD should be a sacrifice. And don't get me wrong, some PhD supervisors feel like it should be a sacrifice. And they're like, you should give up everything that you love and enjoy and only do this. But that is a recipe for burnout. So. Watch your hobbies, make sure you do it. And the one thing I love about this is it actually forces you to communicate with non-academic people because you can get yourself into a little bit of a bubble where you're like, oh, only papers work. My self-worth is dictated by the amount of research output I create. But that is clearly not the case. Once you break out of that bubble and go to, I don't know, go do your hobby. Mine was Brazilian percussion and playing samba. You realize that, oh, there's a world of people that don't care about how many publications I have. And that is what we want to connect with as much as possible. So I read online of this idea of zero days. Make sure that every so often you have zero days where you do nothing related to your PhD and you only look after yourself. Get good sleep, do your hobbies, do the things that energize you and speak to non-academics as often as you can and you want to because you'll realize that academia is only a very small part of your life in the end. Everything else matters more. This is important to get a PhD. You know, you've got to work on it, but this is actually where a lot of people find fulfillment and joy. Don't miss out on all of that. The fourth thing that I see really successful PhD students do is master the supervisor relationship. They are not subservient necessarily to their PhD supervisor. They um, collaborate with them. They communicate. And one thing I love to say is build bridges and not walls. If you are struggling in a certain aspect of your PhD, it's easy to put up a wall poof, and be like, oh no, I can't communicate any of this because people will think I'm a failure or I'm going to uh, be perceived as a bad PhD student. No build bridges. If you're struggling, reach out to people, reach out to your supervisor. And to be honest with you, sometimes the best people you can reach out to if you're struggling and communicate with is not your PhD supervisor, but someone else, a co-supervisor, another postdoc in the lab. That is uh, where you'll find most support most of the time I have found in the past. But building up that professional but friendly and kind of like um, ambitious relationship with your PhD supervisor is so important. Communicate to them two important very things every time you see them like in a professional setting. Where you've been and where you're going. That's it. Super easy. So if you're giving a presentation, think about how you can communicate exactly how you got on in the past, what you've done, the experiments, the results. Let's discuss that a little bit. And then always, always finish your discussion and give a good amount of time for where you're going. Say, I think we should do these things next. This is where I'm going. Where you've been, where you're going. Next meeting, where you've been, where you're going. That positive communication in that relationship will build up confidence. It will build up um, a sense of sort of like momentum and both you and your PhD supervisor will love it. Mark my words. So another thing I want to say about PhD supervisors is they're not always right. We tend to think, especially early on in the PhD, that they're this beacon of truth and amazingness, when in fact, maybe they're not always right. And they don't like to admit it, but they're not. So you do always have to sort of like, look at what they're recommending and just send it through your own filter and then be like, is that true? Is that not true? And then act on your own best kind of interest, I guess, and where your uh, instincts tell you to go. One person said during my PhD, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So if there is something you want to do, just do it and see what happens. So make sure you're communicating, communicate, communicate, communicate. Stay around to the end because they're going to get more and more important as we go along. High performing PhD students also connect with their why often. They have a really good understanding about why they're interested and want to pursue a particular research topic. Now, when you speak to PhD students, a lot of the time they've done a research project or sort of like joined a particular supervisor's um, uh, research group because maybe that research supervisor love bombed them. I've seen that a lot. 
where this PhD supervisor is like, you can do anything, join my lab. And they're like, well, I don't really like what you're doing. And then over here, there's someone that isn't love bombing them, but is a much better fit of their topic and something they're interested in. So connecting regularly with why you're doing something and the enjoyment and the reason and the purpose, I guess, of what you're researching and the outcome you're trying to achieve is what really successful PhD students are good at. Like sometimes I used to think, oh, they're faking their enjoyment of this or they're faking their interest because I didn't find it interesting. But that's the thing is they find it interesting. They get a purpose from it. They understand their why. And a lot of the times it's sort of like related to personal uh, situations, personal things that people have been through, you know, cancer researchers, anyone in their health sort of stuff. Quite often they have quite a intimate connection with their why because they've been affected by the problem. And that's much harder in the material sciences. But I was sort of like working towards solar technology, new tech, renewable, clean tech, like all of that sort of stuff was what I really liked sort of like uh, contributing to and that was my why. So connect regularly with your why and I can assure you it will act as a buffer uh, between you and all of those boring things like the paperwork, the meetings and the politics. Gross. And the last thing that top performing PhD students do is have a sense of fun. That's weird, isn't it? They have fun. Like when I've talked to really high performing PhD students, they seem to have fun. Now there's a load of things that go in to sort of like making something fun. You connect with your why, you see purpose, you see um, sort of like a process that you like, but they seem to find the fun in the things they're doing. And I think a lot of the time, PhD students, and I was one of them at some points during my PhD, we just get so sad and serious. But in fact, just sort of like making sure that all of the things that I've talked about in this list, in this list, all that I haven't filled out this one, what was that? That was connect with why, let's just put why. Um, so yeah, they connect with why and they have fun. Once you sort of are connected with all of these things, you will find yourself having more fun than you thought would be possible during a PhD. And often, I would like to try to break out of the sad and serious nature of doing a PhD just by sort of injecting a bit of fun into my presentations or trying to be a little bit irreverent or just trying to have a fun conversation and then connecting to the enjoyment that a PhD really should be. The problem is, is that quite often the system in which we do a PhD means that fun is very hard to come by because there's pressure, there's um, anxiety, there's a sense of inadequacy, inad there's loneliness. You know, all of the things that we attribute with doing a PhD, but uh, the best PhD students hold on to that sense of fun. So find fun where you can and try not to be so sad and serious. And I know that's harder to do than to say, but ultimately the best PhD students have a sense of fun. They're great to talk to, they're fun to interact with, and uh, finding your fun, whatever that looks like in your PhD, will only help you. If you like this video, go check out this one where I talk about the six PhD habits that will save years of struggle. I think you'll love it.